Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. So you want to notice that if at around 2 or under or slightly under or slightly over, your child is not combining words meaningfully, then this might caution you or this might be a warning to you to continue observing, maybe get a professional opinion. Hello everyone, I'm Rob Hinton. And I'm Genevieve Stewart. Today on Folks, we'll be focusing on reading skills. A couple of experts will tell us why some of our children are having trouble reading and how language can affect learning. We will also visit T.H. Harris Vocational Technical School in Opelousas as we take a look at some exciting programs in vocational education. That and more today on Folks. Everybody says folks. Today we are visiting a library in Baton Rouge as we examine why some of our children are having trouble reading. Now later on in the program, Genevieve will be talking to a couple of experts who will give us their opinions on the subject. But first, a look at the increasing prominence of vocational education. There are 52 post-secondary vocational technical schools in Louisiana, and recently I had the chance to visit one such school in Opelousas. This is T.H. Harris Vocational Technical School. It was established back in 1938 by the Louisiana legislature and has been operating and growing ever since. Students at T.H. Harris are taught the skills and knowledge necessary to enter the labor force as productive workers. Each year, vocational technical schools in Louisiana train over 69,000 students, pursuing one of about 100 different occupational areas, areas ranging from agricultural mechanics to welding. Low-tech schools like T.H. Harris teach skills needed for both established and new industries. We find many of our students who are enrolling now uh, certainly have colleges, college degrees and cannot find jobs. We feel that the ability to perform a task, the ability to do a job, is the best ticket and the fastest ticket to success. One of the more unique programs at T.H. Harris is non-destructive testing. The non-destructive test program is a quality control type program. We use four different methods for quality control in uh, aircraft industry, the oil field, uh, boating industry, and many other things, automobiles, for instance. Uh, every time something happens, for instance, all, every day in the news you hear of uh, an airplane that went down because a boat broke or you know, things like this. All these things have to be inspected. Every pipeline is run through this area. Every weld on it must be inspected to make sure that when you're running several thousand pounds of pressure through there, if you have a bad weld, it may blow. So this is to prevent any of this from happening. We uh, spend approximately half of our time on practical experience. We go out to the field, uh, we have a plant that we go to, and we set up just as though it'd be an own, own job site. And uh, we have portable equipment that we use out there in the field. Desito says so far the non-destructive testing program has had a 100% placement rate. Another popular program at T.H. Harris, as well as other Votech schools, is drafting. The drafting department is designed uh, to meet the needs of the industry and the petroleum industry in Lafayette. We have uh, approximately 13 modules of instruction that we go through the uh, um, year and a half to two year course, depending on the uh, individuals. Uh, it's designed to meet the needs of industry, all phases of petroleum uh, drafting in the petroleum industry. 
Not only is McKinney a drafting instructor, but he is also the father of three Voltec students. My oldest son is now in nursing here, and my uh, uh, middle son is, has graduated, and he's now a successful drafter in the petroleum industry in Lafayette. And uh, my youngest son has just completed a course in electronics here, and he's got a job in Lafayette also. My father has been teaching here for a while. I think it's about 10 years now. Uh, I was here several years ago. I left to go work in the hospital and got a lot of training in physical therapy. So I decided to come back to T.H. Harris and pursue a nursing career. Tell us why you chose nursing, since that is a profession where we don't traditionally see a lot of, a lot of men. Like I said, I had some uh, experience in physical therapy. Uh, medical field really caught my eye a few years ago, and you know, I just want to pursue something in it, possibly go further anesthesia or physician's assistant, something like that. Another popular area of study at T.H. Harris is office occupations. The office occupations department here at T.H. Harris we're very proud of. It's our largest department here at T.H. Harris and we have approximately 200 students enrolled at the present time. We offer five different courses of study and uh, we are predominantly female at the time, but we have several young men in our department that we're very proud of. Una Allen is a former student of the Office Occupations Program. There was a great deal of practical experience, but along with the practical experience, there was things that I needed to learn because I, it had been years since I'd been in a school situation. And I had not worked throughout the years of my marriage, so I needed to learn how to dress. I needed to learn how to be more self-confident because I was a very shy person when I started here. I was more or less a loner. I had my friends through marriage, but this broadened my life so much now that there is, there's very few people in Opelousas that I don't know to say hello to because they've come into the place where I work and it's the best thing I can say about it is it's the most broadening experience that I've had in my life. One reason many students choose to attend Voltec school is economics. Financially, colleges, you're, you're I use the term loosely strung out over a four-year period where you uh, where you running now well when I was in there three four hundred dollars a semester it was five six years ago but now uh, I can't even imagine what it'd be here it's a uh, free education your books are the only cost you've got a uh, education to where all you get is what you need the economy is such that there are many unemployed people at the present time and certainly some of these people are having to make career changes, and for them this is excellent. And I've tell, told many of my students that this is a good place for them to be with the economy as it is now, getting additional training or making career changes if that's the problem. Post-secondary vocational instruction is offered tuition free, and many people in Louisiana do not realize this, that they can obtain this same education that they would get from uh, private business colleges and things like that on a free basis offered by the State Department of Education. It is free in Louisiana to every resident over 16 years of age. And the people who know Votech schools will tell you that vocational education has come a long way from its trade school image. Parents and others thought that perhaps a trade school was for the student who did not have a high IQ or high academic ability they suggested perhaps that he attend trade school. They selected college for those students who had high academic uh, ability and performance. It has changed in that uh, we are no longer the stepchild of education. Uh, educators have found out and are learning that we can prepare students for jobs uh, much faster than colleges can. We can prepare them for the higher technical jobs that normally was uh, left up to colleges. So we feel that uh, things have changed and certainly uh, persons have a better perception of vocational education. I believe that our image as the old archaic name trade school has been uh, done away with and now we are going to 
more of what we are being termed as vocational technical institutions. And uh, that can be verified by the good quality of education that we are experiencing through many of our programs. I am so much in favor of vocational rehabilitation, not rehabilitation, but vocational education that I've allowed my son to come to school half a day while he's in high school. And he's doing pretty well. He's in the air conditioning refrigeration course. And by the time he's finished high school, he'll, he should be far enough along that it'll only take him another semester or two to finish the course. And he'll have knowledge to be able to go out and find a job. He won't have to rely on, on just somebody who's going to, say, train him to do the job he wants. He'll have training. Today, there are well over 250,000 students in Louisiana enrolled in vocational education classes, not only at Voltec schools like T.H. Harris, but also in 500 high schools throughout the state, correctional institutions, and in conjunction with other agencies. Voltec students will tell you that vocational education is an excellent way to prepare for the workforce of today and tomorrow. Everything you'll need in your career to get by with, T.H. Harris has it here. And that, you know, that's all, that's all you need to know when you get out. What do you see in the future for T.H. Harris and for vocational technical schools throughout the state? I see nothing but growth, continued growth. Uh, we have grown in the past uh, few years uh, really dramatically. I see a continuation of that uh, in the future because here again I state that we can prepare uh, graduates for jobs faster than any other uh, school can. I see that it is on its way up. It certainly um, has its merits nationwide, I believe, and the members of American Vocational Association are very active with Congress and uh, bringing it down on state levels through state legislatures. I believe that the Votech schools have a great part to play in the application of the new Job Training Partnership Act called JTPA, which is, has become effective October 1st or 3rd, which was yesterday. And uh, the private industry councils, known as PIC, are working very, very hard to get monies from this JTPA program into all of our Votec schools so that we can utilize this training on nine-month programs to train as many people that qualify for these programs. And I believe that through industry affiliations with education that many of these students will prosper from, will profit from it, I should say, in uh, more ways than they have under the past CEDAR program. Statewide and parish-wide testing of Louisiana school children has revealed that many of them have poor reading skills. Why can't our children read? And how do speech and language affect learning? Recently I put these questions to a couple of experts on these subjects. Dr. Willene Taylor is an associate professor of English at Southern University in New Orleans. Dr. Marilyn Hamilton is an associate professor of speech at LSU in Baton Rouge. Both teachers concur that without a good start in speech, reading, and writing, a child's chances for future success are greatly diminished. These language arts begin at birth with speech. From the earliest stages, a child must have an adequate vocabulary to begin the learning process. But you might want to begin to suspect problems if around 12 months the child is not using any meaningful words because we know that according to the norms, 12-month-olds have us at least a 50-word vocabulary of meaningful words. When they say bye-bye, they, they mean bottle. Maybe that's all they can produce phonologically, but it's meaningful because that particular string or that particular syllable or syllables mm -hmm. refer to the word bottle, okay? Um, so at that point, after 12 months, let's say about 18 months, children begin to combine two word. They, be, they begin to get into the two word stage. So you want to notice that if at around two or uh, under or slightly under or slightly over, your child is not combining words meaningfully, then you, this might caution you or this might be a warning to you to 
continue observing, maybe get a professional opinion, etc. Three-year-olds tend to speak in short, simple sentences. By the time a child is about four, a normally developing child can string a grammatically complete sentence together. That child is comprehending a significantly large number of words. There's just a lot, a lot of progress going on. In other words, you can say the child at about four has begun to, has really begun to crack the linguistic code. Children should have acquired adequate functioning verbal skills by the fourth grade. If their language arts abilities are not intact by then, school can become increasingly difficult for students who are trying to master any subject. By the time the child is in fourth grade, the world changes. The child is now expected to comprehend more complex sentences, to get meaning from topics that he or she may not have experienced necessarily, uh, have, may not have acted upon. So if at that point and in subsequent school years, the child has a language problem that has not gotten remediated at a younger level, you might suspect that as the language learning process becomes more complex, which it will and which it does, and the child's delay is still there, the, the, the learning or the academic success in school will certainly be, be hindered or hampered, or the child will certainly encounter difficulties in learning. And this should transcend all subjects, since language is involved in all subjects. Once a child's speech skills are operating, the natural progression in language arts is reading and writing. This poses another problem. With Louisiana's statewide testing of elementary students in reading, extensive weaknesses were revealed. Standardized testing on the parish level further confirmed the state's test results. And the parish has also cited poor reading achievement for all grades. Dr. Willene Taylor states some reasons for students' difficulties in reading and writing. Our students uh, cannot read and write because basically many of them come from homes where writing and reading are not emphasized. In addition, uh, television plays a great part in the lives of our children. They spend, in my opinion, too much time watching TV and not spending enough with the printed page. The greatest inhibitor the children uh, learning how to write is that we as educators have not demanded that they write. We as educators have not demanded that they write. Uh, we often let them get by with the excuse that they cannot write, uh, they will never learn how to write, and it is my philosophy that if one is uh, in an ocean, for example, and he has an alternative of swimming or drowning that he will swim. Another thing that these overcrowded classrooms and the teachers, let's say, sometimes have 40 and 50 students in the classroom. And so instead of giving them essays to write, many of the students, for example, that I've taught here at Southern in New Orleans, have told me, I don't know how true it is, but from the way that some of them write, that they had never written an essay or a composition until they got to college. Dodgers Taylor and Hamilton agreed that parents can play a very supportive role in developing their children's language skills. Parents should also carefully screen daycare centers where toddlers spend a great portion of their early formative years. One thing that the parents can do if they don't read in the home, they can start reading emphasizing reading. I often take the uh, view that even if you read a funny book or a wrestling book, that's better than reading nothing at all. Also, you should take your child to the library as often as possible so that this child can learn that there are books and that there's much to be learned vicariously through books. Uh, enroll your children in the little summer programs on reading. This can keep them out of the streets. We know that children can get in a lot of trouble during the summer when they don't have anything to do. 
<coughs> if children are to be placed in daycare centers or must be placed in daycare centers for whatever reason, reasons, parents must screen these facilities to be sure that language is a high priority, is a major focus of even the, um, the, the daycare center that's managing the child from zero to three, let's say, because those are the formative years when concepts are developed, vocabulary, the child is getting a handle on how to string things to get together grammatically, et cetera. And then this prime focus must continue through the school years if the child is going to be successful. Testing is one means of assessing a child's knowledge. But without sound language arts, students cannot adequately communicate what they know. Test results are often used as a criteria for determining a child's future educational opportunities and job placement. When you think of an intelligence test, many of us never stop to think how heavily loaded these assessment instruments are with language items. In, in fact, if you were to go through um, an average test, you would find maybe 75% of the items depend upon a person's knowledge of language. So there's an automatic bias there. If a person is language delayed, language language disordered, language is exhibiting a deviancy, et cetera, whatever the adjective we want to choose to describe the problem, well then that person is doubly burdened or doubly biased by being administered an assessment instrument that requires him to, that's going to me measure intelligence, but is going to require him to have adequate language skills. If uh, parents would insist that their children go to the library, and read, they would be able to pass all of these standardized tests that they're going to have trouble with later, like the LSAT, the SAT, and others, and the National Teachers' Exam, which so many of our teachers are having trouble with now. Ghetto dialect, or black English, is considered a definite deterrent to standard language development. Dr. Hamilton explains that ghetto language has an overriding detrimental effect on learning most subject matter. Let's think of a child going into a classroom who, who is speaking what we might call the typical black dialect. Okay, there, the child certainly must make some adjustments in the classroom. That child's language style perhaps is not like the language style of the teacher or maybe of the majority of the children in the classroom. That child's language style is not like the language style used in the textbooks. Therefore, you have, you can see some automatic barriers there. You remember that one of our uh, professional organizations came out with the uh, resolution that students had a right to their language, whatever it was whether that was ghetto speech or Appalachian speech. Um, I think that that did more to inhibit writing on the part of our students than anything else. Just because someone grows up in the ghetto, we cannot allow him to write ghetto speech. We must let him know that in this country, there is such a thing as standard speech. And if you're going to get a job, you're going to have to use that standard speech. The standards for Louisiana college students majoring in education have been raised significantly in recent years. The required student teaching time or actual classroom experience has been tripled. And future elementary school teachers must complete three courses in reading instruction. Dr. Taylor feels that this may not be the only answer for producing literate I think students. That if you have the dedicated teacher, if you don't have any of the other aids or anything, if you have a dedicated teacher, you're going to have a very literate student. Now, many of the students of today had many more opportunities than I did. Um, much more financial aid, many more learning aids. But I learned how to read, write, subtract, divide and add in spite of all of that because we were held to a standard of excellence. We were not allowed to tell our teacher that we were black in America, that we, uh, we had been exploited, because they didn't listen to that. All they wanted to know is that, look, 
you are going to have to learn to read and write. And if not, you're going to have to take this class over. Uh, we shouldn't deal with uh, methods as much as uh, dealing with content. If you know how to read yourself, and I don't want to speak against education because I went to a teacher's college myself, but it was my opinion at that time that we spent too much time on the method courses, on how to teach and not what to teach. Now, if they're going to teach what to teach rather than how to teach, then I'm all for these courses. But to teach someone that you go out in the schools and this is the way you teach reading uh, without, and, and many times those uh, people don't know how to read themselves, and I hate to say that. Uh, but I think the emphasis should be placed upon um, putting out a very literate product from the university. And if he's literate, he's going to know how to teach his students how to read and write. That's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week on Folks, we'll be looking at violent crimes against women and tell you how some of them are fighting back. We hope you'll join us then. Until next time, so long. Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB.